Good evening. Um, thank you all for being here tonight for Langone Speaker Series. My name is Diana Hyde, and I am the Senior Director of the Office of Student Engagement, and we are very pleased to have you all here. Uh, today, our speaker series will be moderated by Tensi Whalen. Professor Whalen is a cl clinical professor of business and society here at Stern. And our guests today are father-daughter duo, Jeffrey and Mika Hollander. Uh, Jeffrey is the co-founder and former CEO of Seventh Generation is, and is an NY adjunct professor, which he might be talking about a little bit. And Mika is a Stern alumna and the co-founder and co-CEO of Sustain Natural. Please welcome our guests. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for coming out on a Friday night. And I want to welcome Mika back. Uh, as you may know, she was the head of, the, uh, of SEA um, for the president for two years, I think, or one year, for one year, year right? Exactly, that's only one year term. Um, and, uh, and now is the, uh, the CEO and, and founder of Sustain along with Jeff. Um, she's also been listed on the Forbes 30 Under 30, uh, Fast Company's Most Creative People. Um, and she has two books out. The second one called Get on Top is coming out actually shortly in, in uh, spring 2018. And we were talking a little bit earlier and I was asking, um, you know, sort of what is something fun and interesting about your background, and she mentioned that when she applied to Stern, she, there was a creative essay you had to write, and she, wrote, she made it out of all the concert tickets that she had um, collected going to concerts, as well as song lyrics, and told the story of her life that way, which I thought was wonderful, and I would like to see it, actually. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. <laughs> it's still around. I'm sure it is. Um, uh, and Jeff Hollander, as we heard, uh, um, started out through with um, founding Seventh Generation, which is ubiquitous today. You'll, you'll, as you probably know, Unilever bought it, and it's uh, you can find Seventh Generation products in virtually every retailer around uh, around the country. He's written seven books, so Mika has a little little bit a ways to go, um, including the Responsibility Revolution and how the next generation of businesses will win. Um, he was co-founder of Brooklyn's Community Capital Bank uh, and the founder of Skills Exchange in Toronto and Network for Learning in New York City. He's also the chair of Greenpeace Fund US and a board member of Verite, which works on labor rights, among other organizations. Um, he, he also founded uh, American Sustainable Business Council, right, uh, which is a coalition of 200,000 business leaders. So um, I, I also want to mention that Sheila Hollander is here too, and it's, it's really a family affair, so we're glad to have you here too. Thank you. So um, to kick this off, we're going to have a sort of chat, and then a 45-minute chat or so, and then open up to, to questions from, from the group. Uh, so Jeff, I wonder if you could tell us a bit about how you came up with the idea for Seventh Generation. What was it like to get, that, to get the company started, you know? How yeah. Did it go? So, you know, it was a while ago, almost 30 years ago, and it was well before sustainable green products were in people's consciousness. And I had written my first book called How to Make the World a Better Place, A Beginner's Guide, and it was really my exploration of the ways in which I could make a positive difference. And while I was very drawn to issues of social justice, uh, and human rights, I couldn't figure out how to turn them into a business. Um, and I had come across a mail order catalog that was published by a nonprofit in Washington called Renew America, and they were trying to earn some extra income by selling energy and water conservation products, and it was not very successful. Uh, so we took over the catalog from them, and that was really the foundation of Seventh Generation, was those water and energy conservation products. And we then expanded into paper products and cleaning products. And it was early. Uh, you know, we went, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, it's sort of shocking to, to, to remember 13 years before we made any money because we were so early on in the market. And it was really, to a large extent, Whole Foods' success and our ability to sell products in all of their stores that really sort of turned the business around. 
And once we were successful in Whole Foods, then Target and other retailers wanted uh, to carry the products. And did, during that time period, did you see customer or con consumer demand shift as well over that period of time? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there, you know, as really awareness for organic food, which is where most people sort of start the consumer journey towards natural products, began to grow more and more and more. Uh, to a certain extent, household products got carried along with the wave towards buying organic food and then natural organic personal care products. And household products tend to be later in the adoption process of that consumer sort of journey. Um, and it was, it was you know, it, it, there's great benefits being first to the market and being early, and there's great challenges. And uh, as, I, as I have learned, it's hard to sell something that people don't know they need. And so we had to do a tremendous amount of education in terms of helping people understand why it was important for them in terms of their health and the planet to buy products that had less of a negative impact. Thank you. Mika, what was it like to grow up around your father and mother while they were launching this company? I understand you were the inspiration for a set of products that they developed, that you interned at the company. I'd love to hear a little bit about how this became part of your DNA. Yeah, so, well, it was, it was, we were born about in the same year. So I always sort of think of seventh generation as my older sibling. Um, and, you know, it was in a lot of ways a really amazing experience and in a lot of ways sort of was a <laughs> guide for why you would never want to be an entrepreneur because <laughs> um, it was obviously very challenging. As Jeffrey said, it took a long time to really sort of crack the code on the natural products market and they were very much first in that space um, within sort of the household cleaning and personal care. So it was actually, I sort of grew up thinking that I would never want to do this. This looks terrible. Um, and then, you know, on the flip side of that, I also grew up thinking that every single business in the world is set on a path to always do the right thing and that why would you ever make any policy or any product that doesn't make the world a better place and doesn't make your employees happy. Um, so going to college and working in sort of the quote unquote real world um, was a very rude awakening in the way, unfortunately, a lot of businesses and corporations do operate. So I found my way back um, to the natural product space and basically followed in exactly in my father's footsteps, um, which I actually never thought I would do. And why did you decide to go to business school, uh, you know, given that background in the first place? Um, I, it was something that I was interested in but sort of pushed into in terms of taking the GMAT while I was still an undergrad. Um, mm -hmm. by my mom. So I, I, you know, I left, I went to NYU also as an undergrad. I was in Gallatin. I worked at a big um, agency in New York for a couple years and was just really unhappy with working with Fortune 500 companies um, and sort of came back to business school to sort of figure out a path of how am I actually going to spend my life in terms of my career. And I mean, really, before Jeff went to seventh generation, I always sort of planned to go. I think most of my essays were about going back to seventh generation mm -hmm. and working for the family business. And Jeffrey actually wouldn't let me do that when I graduated from college. He sort of pushed me out. Mm -hmm. um, so it was sort of like, OK, well, I'll go back to school, figure out what you want to do. Um, and then while I was here, ended up mm -hmm. helping birth sustain. Great. So Jeff, can you tell us for any would-be entrepreneurs here, social entrepreneurs, what were some of the success factors, the challenges that you learned at, at Seventh Generation? And I know actually some of them are lessons that you've applied to, to the new company, right? But if you could tell us a little bit of yeah. you know, mistakes you made, successes you had, how it worked. Well, if I talk about the mistakes, that will <laughs> people won't get any sleep tonight. <laughs> Um, I think they'll get sleep. <laughs> no, there's a lot of mistakes. Maybe I, I made. won't. But. There's a lot of mistakes I made. Um, you know, I think, and it's something that I always advise my students. I mean, the first thing is you have to start with what you're passionate about because being an entrepreneur, being a social entrepreneur, is a challenging thing to do. 
And if you're not deeply in love and committed to what you're doing, you'll find more than enough reasons to give up along the way. Uh, uh, I remember a story that was once written about the, the nine lives of seventh generation having almost gone out of business so many times that people lost count. So you have to be committed. And you, you, you know, one of my experiences was I was always able to find a way to keep going as long as I was committed to keep going. That most people go out of business when they sort of give up and decide that they don't want to go any further. Um, I think another thing that is, is important is, is to not follow in my footsteps and sell things that people don't yet know they need. I mean, that's a really, really tough thing to do. And I think one of the reasons why Sustain has become so successful much more quickly is because it was the right time for that set of products to happen, where seventh generation was really, really early. Um, one of the most important and fulfilling parts of running seventh generation was part of business that often doesn't get a lot of attention, which is the internal culture of the company. And managing, developing, cultivating that culture was one of the most pleasurable and challenging things that, that I ever did. And, uh, you know, it's really interesting today to watch Mika create a culture around sustain. It, it's not my influence at all. Uh, she thinks I'm joking when I say that I work for her, but I, 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 I to a large extent, feel like I'm here for her. Uh, and she's uh, become the CEO of the company. Um, you need money. I mean, one of the things that causes so many businesses to go out of business is they run out of cash. And cash is like oxygen. If you don't have money in the bank, it's pretty hard to keep the business going. And a lot of people are daunted by the fundraising process, which we are in right now. Uh, it feels like it never stops. I think that I have raised money every other year of my business career for the last 40 years. And if you don't commit the time and you don't commit the energy that is required, you just won't raise the money. Uh, so being really disciplined and focused about the fundraising process, and again, here we are in a situation where Mika now is leading that fundraising process at Sustain. She knows firsthand how much time it takes. I mean, it, it, it is hard to run a business and raise money at the same time because it is such a huge distraction. And it's largely a very, very inefficient process. I mean, you know, I think we're keeping track of how many venture capital firms we've talked to, and we're probably up to about 50 so far, and we haven't yet closed the, the funding. So being focused on raising money is really important. So I'll leave it at that. So two questions. One is around raising funds. Are you looking for investors who share your values, right? So are you looking for a particular type of investor? And secondly, on the culture front, what was one example of something you did to create a, a real culture at yeah. generation? So let me answer that first. And the story around culture are some of the stories that I'm the most proud of. Uh, uh, and this is, this is an example of the seventh generation culture. So back in about 1992, seventh generation got its, probably maybe 93, got its products into a chain of grocery stores called Albertsons, which is in Southern California. Just after we got our products on the shelf and everyone was celebrating and they were so exciting because it was the first traditional grocery store that we had ever gotten into, there was a labor strike at Albertsons because the management of the store was reducing the health care benefits of the workers as a way to improve their profitability. And so we as a company had a great debate because some people felt we shouldn't be doing business with Albertsons. They don't have the same values that we have. Why should we make money off of a retailer who is treating their employees poorly and not providing them with health insurance. And about the other half of the company uh, felt that we're in business not for Albertsons, but to take care of our consumers. And by pulling our products off the shelf, 
we would be depriving our consumers of the products that would help them lead a healthier and safer life. And so, first of all, the fact that the conversation is even happening. Well, wasn't it a junior person that like walked into your office and brought it to your attention? Well, it was a junior person who walked in with the solution um, because oh. the, the solution, which was a brilliant solution, which was not my idea, was that we decided to take all of the profits from our sales at Albertsons and donate them to the workers' strike fund so that the workers could maintain a longer strike and have a greater chance of winning back their health care benefits. So we, we, we took quite a risk because Albertsons probably wouldn't have been very happy about that. But at the same time, we were able to do what we felt was right while we honored our obligation and commitment to our customers. And, and to me, it's those types of things that made Seventh Generation a really special company. And it's why I always felt that, that you know, in a lot of places, when you sort of peel back the onion, you fi find sort of yick, icky stuff inside. We like to think that the more you learned about Seventh Generation, the, the more delighted you would be because it was better on the inside than it was on the outside. Uh, well, let's come back to the um, investing question. I'll ask it around sustain okay. particularly. So Mika, I understand that your father came to you when you were at Stern um, with his business plan for the first green condom and uh, um, he asked for your advice. So can you tell us what advice you gave him and, and wh how and why you decided to get involved with the company? Yeah, so um, in the summer uh, between my two years, Jeffrey came to me and sort of with a draft of a business plan on a fair trade condom company. Um, actually, 20 years ago, he trademarked the name Rainforest Rubbers, which is hilarious, but absolutely not what I wanted to call the business. Um, and so I thought it was really interesting, but I really didn't see sort of a big market opportunity for just a fair trade condom. Um, I thought it was a little too niche. So what I started doing, which was sort of based on my experience before I started at Stern, was looking at the condom category and trying to figure out what was going on and where the opportunity was. Um, and someone discovered that 40% of condoms were purchased by women. So I thought that was really interesting. Because um, when you look at the condom category, um, it's really controlled by two brands, which is another good sort of place to find white space. And it's the anti sort of feminist category. It's a big ego, whatever, I'll, I could go on about that. But it's, it's not pretty. So I thought as, you know, there was a real opportunity to actually create a brand for women in this category, which we now call you know, all of our products are vagina friendly. Um, and that was sort of how we packaged this all together. We looked at the sexual health crisis happening in the US. We looked at how it was affecting women disproportionately. And we looked at where condoms and who was buying condoms. Um, and that, that sort of insight around you know, combining a female focused brand in this category and making the first most sustainable condom in the world was what got us onto the shelves at retail um, pretty much before we even launched the product. Women are shopping this category. The buyers at, you know, everywhere from Whole Foods to some of the grocery chains we started at knew that, um, and obviously saw the movement in the natural products category across other categories and saw an opportunity um, in the condom space. Great. So maybe you can tell us a bit about Sustain today. What what types of products in addition to condoms you have, and what have uh, ben, you were telling me a bit earlier about some of the challenges and sort of some amazing ups and downs over the last couple of years. So love to hear more about that. Yeah, so it has been a roller coaster. Um, selling condoms, natural condoms to women um, is not easy. So in terms of what Jeffrey was saying about changing behavior, we probably started in the hardest category, at least that I could think of right now. Um, we were really treated, and I in particular, being a young woman, felt like people put us in the same category as marijuana, as alcohol. This was a vice product, um, and that was really challenging. So because of Jeffrey's experience at Seventh Generation, we launched the brand only with condoms and first only at retail. Um, you know, We over time learned that women 
and men in particular spend about seven seconds in front of that aisle. Um, so that's a very challenging way to launch a new brand. Um, people aren't picking up the product and looking at the packaging and reading the ingredients on the back of the box. And on top of that, you know, while we got the space on shelf, we didn't get end caps. We didn't get to participate in certain coupon programs. We didn't have Bed Bath & Beyond sending out email blasts to their customers about a new condom brand. So we sort of, you know, on top of starting in this insanely stigmatized category, you know, also st stepped into a category where it was going to be extremely challenging to not only get the trust of a customer, because this is a very, you know, you need to have the efficacy first and foremost, um, and on top of that, get people to actually feel good about making this purchase and take the extra minute in the aisle to actually evaluate the product. Um, so that was really challenging. So we spent the first two years selling condoms, organic lubricant um, in year two, and then wipes in year two as well, only at retail. And it didn't, it really didn't work. Um, it worked in terms of the revenue from year one to year two increased, but not really at a exciting, you know, continuing to raise money with not very exciting growth is challenging. So about a year ago, um, I don't really like to call it a pivot, but an expansion. We, you know, how are we going to deal with this problem? How are we going to get women to be basically buy condoms? And because of all the dynamics happening at the shelf and because women feel actually ashamed making this purchase, we thought about why are we not, why don't we have an e-commerce business? Um, so what we did was we hired the former head of acquisition from Thinks Underwear, um, who had obviously built, I don't know if you guys are familiar with them, but a hugely successful business in a very short period of time in a taboo category, and really worked with him to s create a roadmap for our product portfolio our, and our e-commerce business. Um, and my mom, who had been a huge advocate of organic cotton feminine care at seventh generation, forced the, or not forced, but pushed aggressively the idea to reevaluate how that would fit under the sustained portfolio, which obviously it fit perfectly. So we basically, in a year, shifted from being a completely retail business to now an 80% of our revenue coming from our e-commerce business and really created a subscription company. So created Organic Cotton Feminine Care as a subscription. And as one customer said so brilliantly, by selling women organic cotton tampons, they felt like we were giving them permission to buy condoms and lubricant and wipes and things that they wouldn't necessarily feel comfortable about. So obviously our goal and our mission is to make everyone feel awesome about buying and carrying condoms, but the reality is that's gonna take a lot of time and a lot of education and e-commerce is the best way for us to do that um, and have that direct relationship with the customer. So today we're really an e-commerce subscription company um, selling all your vagina-friendly essentials. Um, you talked a bit about, um, uh, well, let me, let me uh, go a bit first to the sort of finance question. So you mentioned earlier that you were now um, raising funds for the next round. So I would be interested to hear from, from both of you, you know, how do you go about uh, raising funds for this particular stigmatized business um, do you want to have uh, investors that are really aligned with your values? Any sort of challenges on the type of investors that are interested? Love to hear, hear a bit about that. I think the interesting thing and sort of beneficial thing is because of the category we're in, you know, you're not going to really find somebody who's not aligned because mm -hmm. it's very challenging. So when Jeffrey says we've talked to probably 50 VCs, a big percentage of those VCs say no right off the bat because their LPs are again, treating this as a category that they would treat sort of drugs and alcohol. Um, so you sort of find those people who are excited and aligned a little bit more quickly in a way because they stand out and because they're taking a chance and they see sort of the bigger picture. Um, but I don't, know, I don't know how they differ from the people at seventh generation, but it's definitely a, you know, a challenging thing for some people and some institutional investors to get their head mm -hmm. around. You know, I think <clears throat> most investors would like to invest in a business that's having a positive effect on the world. Um, but I would say that despite a lot of the news otherwise, 
they probably don't want to give up any of their potential return to do that. And so, you know, you, you have to convince them that as a, a business, which, you know, I mean, I, I certainly can speak for myself, we didn't start this business just to make money. That's not why we did what we do, and that's never why I've done what I've done. But if you can't convince these investors that they will make as much money as they're likely to make doing anything else, you're unlikely to get a check from them. And so, uh, you, you, you know, and, and that creates a challenge. I, I, I wouldn't say we have a screening process to screen out investors that aren't aligned with our values. But we've turned down people who... <coughs> we have. We we've did, turned down that's large true. checks. We did turn down We turned down one large really checks. large check because... Because of values. The individuals sort of was publicly known and was associated with things that were so contrary to sort of female empowerment around se female sexuality and sexual health. So, you know, it was very, it, it was challenging. I mean, I, that was probably one of the more stressful things and just sort of internal debates that we had to have around, you know, we were, we were struggling at the time. It was about a year ago. Um, and honestly, a year ago, I didn't, we didn't know if this was, business was going to work. And thank God that's dramatically changed in a short period of time. But it's hard when you're basically like, down and out and, and looking for a lifeline and somebody's giving it to you to say no because right. of their values. Um, and they were very compelling and very aggressively trying to convince us otherwise. But, you know, at the end of the day, you kind of have to go with your gut and you can't, even if it's a point, you know, 5% risk that some, you know, who's going to find out that this person is our investor? Nobody. But it, it's, it's not about that. It just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. um, and how are your employees going to feel about that? Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's definitely when you're a mission-driven business, you know, it presents, you sometimes end up doing that screening without even deliberately doing it. Yeah. And plus, you know, Sheila started a program called 10% for Women where we give away 10% of our profits to women's reproductive health care, which is primarily given to Planned Parenthood, that's something that's polarizing in and of itself. And just the commitment to give away 10% of your profits means there's less money for investors. Um, so there, there are definitely challenges. And, and in some ways, you have to do better than other companies to make up for being a B Corporation and saying that we're committed to taking care of not just our investors. I mean, we, we have, you know, signed a legal document that basically says we're committed to our employees, our community, the environment, our, and, and other stakeholders, not just our employees. I mean, not just our investors. Um, and, and to me, being a B Corporation is the gold standard for responsible businesses. If you're going to be a responsible business, I would expect a business to be a B Corporation. Um, but we will raise the money. We're, we're, we're close. We're almost done. We're almost God. there. Uh, but it is, it's amazing, given how much it's critical for every business to have capital, how inefficient and challenging the process is. Even today, uh, you know, it hasn't gotten much better than it was 30, 40 years ago. So could you, you're an advocate for businesses having a net positive impact in addition to them being um, B corporations. And I actually was using one of your articles to teach my students yesterday about that. So it was, it was very helpful. Um, but I wonder if you could tell us a bit about that concept and then specifically how you're translating that into real impact at Sustain. Yeah. So, you know, part of the idea, uh, you know, when I, when I left Seventh Generation in 2010, and I reflected on what I had and hadn't accomplished, one of the things that was really clear was that seventh generation sold wonderful products that were better than most of our competitors. And yet at the same time, those products were primarily having a less harmful effect than the alternative products. So yes, we had the best paper towels you can buy, but those paper towels were still using energy to be manufactured, we're still using water, we're still using a whole bunch of natural resources, 
contributing to climate change. So even though we were having less of a negative impact, that wasn't the same as having a positive impact. And I think we've gotten confused between what is a good product and what is a less bad product. And in order to deal with the challenges we're facing, like climate change, we, don't, we have to go beyond being neutral in our impact. We have to have a, a regenerative impact. We have to capture CO2 out of the environment, put it back in the ground. We have to have a positive effect. And so one of the objectives of, of Sustain was to create a company that sold products that actually had a positive effect. And that's why we ended up focusing on condoms, because condoms come from an agricultural source. So they are the sap of the rubber tree. So the rubber tree is accumulating CO2 out of the environment, and we can tap the rubber tree without having an adverse effect on that tree. We were able, as Mika said, to create a fair trade supply chain where the plantation that we buy the latex from is providing free education for all the rubber tappers' kids, provide free health care. Um, we're paying a premium to those workers. And we were able to obviously have a product that is preventing the growth of disease, but also helping women to manage the size of their families. And women having that opportunity to manage the size of their families is one of the most important ways to manage population, which is the second biggest contributor to climate change, population growth. So there's many, 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 many aspects at which we believe, and we haven't finished documenting this, that this product actually has a positive effect, that even though there are some negative effects in the transportation and manufacturing, the positive effects of a condom way outweigh the negative effects. And so for me personally, the goal was to model a business around this net positive idea with the hope that other people will copy what we're doing and will lead to a new generation of sustainable businesses that are net positive rather than less bad. And there are um, other big, big companies that actually have taken up this, uh, taken up the mantle. Kingfisher, what are some of the companies that are doing Kingfisher this? Kingfisher has O2, which is a European telecom company. Uh, Ikea. Kingfisher is like a um, Home Depot, Lowe's company in right. Europe. Yeah. And, you know, the, the idea, and it's a challenge for these big companies because they have huge, huge impacts. Um, but I, I do believe that this idea of net positive is where we need to go. And we, we have a lot of challenges because our rules and regulations and the way the marketplace works doesn't necessarily incentivize businesses for behaving this way. So one of the reasons to start the American Sustainable Business Council was to work on changing the rules and the regulations that govern business so that these types of companies would be more rewarded in the marketplace. Just a little advertisement for the Center for Sustainable Business here at Stern. For those of you who are not familiar with it, um, we have now a sustainable business specialization for MBAs and are doing a lot of work around this very topic. End of, end of advertisement. <laughs> no, but, we, but, but while you're advertising, <laughs> I have a class coming up in January. Yes, There's still some spots in it, so uh, feel free to register. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So... Um, and by the way, Jeff's, Jeff's fabulous, so do take him up on that offer. Um, so, Mika, uh, can you talk a little bit about, I was just sort of thinking through what your father was saying around, for example, the rubber tappers and uh, figuring out your procurement and sourcing, right? So if you have a variety of different products, you have to deal with organic issues, chemicals, all sorts of things. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you've put in place the sustainable procurement program and the certifications and is that hard and you know can others do it it's hard and it's expensive oh. um, it's you know what we've found is what we did when we started with the condoms was we kind of went a little certification crazy um, so we got the fair trade con certification, we got the vegan certification, we got the non-GMO certification, we got the B Corp certification. I'm not, I don't, there's like three more. Um, and it, and that was a little, it was important because I think on the one hand, the real value is, you know, we really went above and beyond and we gained the trust of our consumers. 
Um, so now, you know, when you bring somebody in through the condom experience, they've seen you've gone sort of above and beyond to certify yourself. Um, we could have a whole separate certification conversation around why you need to have a non-GMO condom. Um, and that's, that sort of enabled us to go into other product categories with that trust. So it, for example, you know, we wanted to get into the organic cotton tampon and pad business. We couldn't get the organic cotton certification in time in terms of launch. So we have been working on that for the last few months um, and it'll come next year. But again, and maybe this is a good thing or a bad thing, because we went through that process for over a year with the condoms, people trust that if we say we're working on getting this certification that we are and that it's coming. Um, and if we say something's organic cotton, they believe us. And you know, we are sort of overly transparent in terms of our ingredients, in terms of what we're doing well and what we're not doing well. Um, right now, for example, I've been spending our current crisis is staffing our customer experience team. Um, we're just way inundated with people asking questions about our products and about well, where their order is too. But I've, you know, I've sort of trained our team and instilled in our team to never hide behind what we're not doing right. If people are challenging us on why, even though we have a bioplastic applicator for our tampons and it's much, much better for the environment than a petroleum-based plastic, it still creates waste. It still can create waste. So if somebody's challenges on that, it's important for us to say, we know, you know, we're working to do better. We're working on an applicator-free tampon. And I've actually had, I've trained our team so deeply that if people are coming to us with certain issues like, you know, my period's so heavy, you guys don't have the right products, tell them about the menstrual cup. There's, we don't sell that product, but we're here to help them and be their partner to have the best, healthiest, safest experience um, when it comes to their reproductive and sexual health. And that means sometimes pointing people in another direction. Great. So you um, work at being an advocate for women's issues as well as running, your, or running the business or, or um, co-running the business. I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about what you're doing there, where you see um, the opportunity for positive impact. And also, this is slightly um, off the side, but you mentioned earlier that the current political situation has actually helped your company. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that as well. Yeah, I mean, it's been, it's been pretty amazing to be in this sort of sexual and reproductive health space from a product and business standpoint, also to an, from an advocacy standpoint, um, where, you know, November 8th of 2016 actually changed everything. Um, and it, you know, in some ways has become a very dark time for these issues, but the way that we're seeing it and the way that we're able to sort of amplify our message and lobby for change has been incredible. Um, you know, Jeffrey brought up that we give a huge portion of our sort of profits and we're constantly supporting Planned Parenthood. We just, on Cyber Monday, gave 100% of all sales on the site to them um, for Cyber Monday rather than doing any sort of discounting. And, you know, interestingly, I use that analogy or I use this analogy of before the election, whenever we did any outbound email link talking about why we were supporting Planned Parenthood, we got tens, 20, 30, 40 emails saying, oh my God, I love your products, but this is horrifying. I can't purchase from you anymore. Please change your ways. And we now, you know, our list a year or two ago, we were sending an email to 20,000 people. Now we're sending email to over 200,000 people. And we got two emails. Wow. Um, and so I think that really speaks to women in particular didn't understand what was at risk. Um, there was a little bit less at risk, obviously, before the election. But a lot of these issues in terms of looking at the millions of women who don't have access to reproductive health care or family planning services, looking at, you know, birth control was only became sort of free for a lot of people very recently. Uh, and someone like my sister never lived in a world where that wasn't accessible, that wasn't free. Um, and so when these rights sort of became at risk, you got an entire generation, multiple generations of women speaking up and standing up and advocating that were really passive before. And that's been, you know, it's obviously challenging to watch the news, but in terms of the space, but it's created an amazing opportunity and really has been inspirational for me um, to see where I think we'll end up in a better place than we were 
before. It's nice to hear there's a silver lining, yeah. <laughs> um, so tell us a little bit about what it is to work as a father-daughter team. How does, you know, what, what, what are the, the great high points and what are some of the challenges? The classic question. <laughs> We've never not been asked that question. I can imagine, you know, I'm sorry. Well, you left out like in a condom business. <laughs> condom. So that's, that's usually like the, the thing. Um, you can answer first. I can, okay. I always defer to my daughter. Um, well, that's recent, by the way. Yeah. We had to work to get here. <laughs> you know, it's, it's really less about the subject matter of our business, which does not create, other than one or two times, an awkward situation. Um, there, there's a couple of times where I have drifted into conversation that she felt was inappropriate, but that's the, a small part of the dynamic. You know, mo most of the dynamic is really about the challenges and opportunities of, of working with my daughter and, and where is it no longer appropriate for me to take the lead and to let her take the lead. And uh, I think, you know, I, I, I feel incredibly lucky to have the opportunity to share so much of what I've learned in my business career with her for me to have her be as interested in what I've learned as she is, is really a, a, a wonderful gift. Um, and, you know, I think probably the only challenge is making sure there's still space for the personal part of the relationship, since so much of the conversation we have is about business. Um, but it, it, it hasn't, I mean, I think, in some ways, we, we and, and you know, Sheila gets more credit than I do in terms of creating a family where there was a great deal of openness and comfort in talking about issues of sex, where it wasn't something that was not talked about. And I think in many ways, the foundation for us being able to work together in this space was laid in the early years of our family, and we're now, in a sense, being able to reap the benefits of that by being able to work together in a business that, you know, people do find shocking. I mean, the number of media stories about the father and daughter condom company, um, um, you know, we're, we're sort of, there's no more places that that story can run, but that generated <laughs> a lot of media attention. Yeah, I mean, it's funny. I think there's a class here called Family Business Management, um, which I didn't take. Um, but it seemed like the net of that was, it's very challenging, and maybe you should rethink it before you do it. And, and everybody, I talked to a lot of people in family businesses before I got in, I almost used the analogy of got in bed with them to do this business, but that's obviously inappropriate here. Um, I And everybody told me, absolutely, do not do it. Don't do it. It's going to ruin your relationship. And the first year or two were really challenging. I was young, much younger, very you know, insecure, did not know what I was doing, still don't really. But, um, and I was very sort of, I felt like I needed to prove myself constantly. And that created a lot of friction. Um, and it was challenging. And we spent a lot of time working on our relationship, both professionally and personally, the three of us, because um, Sheila has been involved, and and that was super important. I don't think we would have made it work without that. Um, and now, I sort of probably about a year ago, um, it just felt like everything changed, and I, you know, I started to see the insane value of and sort of incredibleness of everything my dad had built. Um, and how much, how amazing it was that I have this resource. I mean, I can, I feel like, you know, 90%, 80% of any question I have from a management standpoint, how to manage people, how to manage a situation, how to deal with an investor, you know, I have somebody who usually knows the answer, or I hope that he does. Um, and that's, you know, what, what an amazing benefit. Mm -hmm. um, 
And, and another part of it, which is sort of different and a little outside of family, um, which I think is an unfortunate reality right now, is that a lot of my peers and a lot of people I know who are either sort of solo female founders or two female founders have faced a crazy amount of challenge around fundraising um, and a lot of other things because of that. So, you know, a lot of people, I get that question a lot, um, particularly if we're not speaking together, and I feel like, you know, I'm very upfront that having a, no offense, older white man sort of sitting next to me at the table is, is mm -hmm. still like a big yeah. benefit. Yep. <laughs> nice to know you're still relevant, Jeff, huh? As an older white man. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well. Um, so, so let me ask uh, just sort of some c c career question, two last questions, and then open up to the group. So Mika, as a Stern alum, what advice do you have for your um, you know, compatriots here about how to pursue a career with purpose and where and profits? Um, I mean, again, I feel like, you know, it's no coincidence that I started it with my dad and he started Seventh Generation. I mean, that was hugely beneficial for obviously a lot of reasons, and it still is. Um, I, I actually found my, my most helpful experience at Stern was running the Social Enterprise Association. Um, it was weird. A lot of the things that I learned doing that and were, you know, the challenges that I faced doing that were very similar to sort of like the very early days of starting Sustain because you were sort of running an organization. Um, and, you know, I think the only other advice I have um, is taking the classes that are scary and challenging because I think, at least for me, I tended to take the things that I felt I was good at or naturally gravitated towards. Um, but again, just going back to what Jeffrey said earlier, you know, it, this wouldn't work if I didn't sort of blood, sweat, and tears of every minute into this business because I'm so passionate about the mission. Um, and because I, you know, if I'm not working and I'm not in the office and I'm out doing sort of work with Planned Parenthood or in DC and working on the book, I mean, it's, it's definitely a nonstop grind and you need to sort of accept that going into it and I think the only way you can be fueled is if you're just sort of a hundred percent and hundred and ten percent passionate about sort of what you're trying to do. Jeff so you're teaching Stern students and I'm sure they asked you about this what, what, what's your advice additional yeah. advice? Well you know the good news is there's never been a better time to get into the world of corporate responsibility and sustainable business uh, or social entrepreneurship. Um, not only is the need for it uh, exponentially greater than it has ever been. So, you know, if we don't generate uh, new business leaders who have a very different perspective and mindset about the goals of their business, we will be in deep trouble as a, uh, 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 with this planet and with our race. Um, so, it's, it's desperately needed. There are also consumers, so many more than ever before, who were looking for these types of products and services. So the market is better than it has ever been. So if, you know, the, compared to when, when we started Seventh Generation and we were such early pioneers, it was really difficult. <clears throat> Today, I mean, you know, if, if, if all goes according to plan, not only will sustain grow 150% this year, but it will grow 500% or more next year. That can only happen because the market is there. And there's so many women, so many consumers that are looking for these better, healthier, safer products and wanting to do business with and, and support a company that's really committed to having a positive effect on the planet. So, you know, it, it, it couldn't be a better time. Um, now, that doesn't mean you don't have to have all the same business skills and capabilities yeah. that everyone else has, because the truth is, you know, just because you're making the world a better place doesn't mean you can be any less good at reading a balance sheet or doing a cash flow statement. So you have to have all those fundamental skills. And I think the unique skills, I, I, I tell people that one of the most important disciplines that helps you be a good sustainability entrepreneur is the discipline of systems thinking. And that helps you 
understand the unintended consequences of what you do, which is such a problem in most traditional businesses. Yeah. Something that I always say to, I mean, I, I get asked a lot. I, it's not also, it, it's not something that you have to do immediately. I think I felt like this when I was in business school and I, and I feel like this now as I'm hiring people. You know, as much as I want to hire people who just come and say I'm obsessed with sustain, I'll do whatever. Um, if we're hiring a COO, we need someone with operations experience. Um, you know, we need people or, or finance experience. You know, we need people who actually have those hard skills, as Jeffrey's saying. Um, so there's no, you know, there's no downside in my mind, and there should be nothing wrong with going into a finance career or consulting career for a few years to get those skills to add the value to these types of companies. Because I, I felt a little lost when I was in business school thinking about how do I go into sort of like a sustainable business career? Um, and you need, you sort of need a, a point of entry. Yeah. I mean, you can, whether you're a lawyer or accountant, a doctor, whatever the discipline is, you can do that in a sustainable, responsible way. And that's sort of what is so exciting is that the, the opportunity to have a positive impact can be applied to any career, no matter what you're doing. I was looking at uh, Sophie Rifkin, who works with the Center for Sustainable Business, and smiling because we we all we say that all the time. Exactly that, you know, it, whatever you're going to go into, sustainability is going to can be a part of it and will be a part of it because the world is changing and yep. people and expectations are changing. And also, if you want to specifically do sustainability, that um, getting experience in supply chain or in marketing or whatever your particular interest is first is is always incredibly helpful. So. Thank you so much. Uh, really terrific. And now let's open it up to questions. We've got um, uh, our microphones up there. If you don't mind stepping out to them, if you can, just because we're streaming this for YouTube. I know it's a bit of a pain. But does anybody have any questions? Yes. OK. <laughs> it's its first time out, so I'm just telling. This was this is how you know you have the right investor. We had randomly were contacted by a fund in Sweden that only invests in menstrual hygiene products. So didn't know they existed, <laughs> but when they wired us the money, they also sent me this necklace. So that's that was a good values check. So our number one strategy was public relations, uh, because this was before social media and it was before e-commerce. And we over, you know, we built a couple hundred million dollar business literally with no advertising whatsoever, because we found that publicity was such a great avenue to have that discussion with consumers. Now, to generate enough publicity to be effective in that educational process, you have to be incredibly creative in terms of what you do because laundry detergent and bathroom tissue are not the sexiest things around. So we had to do things like, you know, the Albertson story is a good example of what we did that was newsworthy. I remember uh, when we, at Seventh Generation, introduced tampons uh, 15 years ago we introduced them with an opportunity for you to get shipped a free shipment of tampons to be given to the local women's shelter in your community. And so we started with a cause, and it was that program that got the media attention, not the fact that we were selling tampons, but that gave us the opportunity to have the conversation. So, you know, I mean, Mika's been an, uh, amazing from a publicity perspective. Uh, she just did a video with Now This that organically has about 10 million views. That is just irreplaceable when it comes to building awareness and having a positive effect from an educational perspective. Just, one, yes. just along that same point, one time, so 
ecosystem. Um, all the social good you're doing, where you get the, uh, the latex from, things like that, there's a cost. There's an additional cost that a lot of other manufacturers don't have. So in order for you to have a sustainable business, um, you need to pass those costs along to the consumer. And you've got to hope that they're willing to pay a little more uh, for that, that they want to see the same social good you do. And that's not often the case, and you can try to promote it all you like. But is there, is there, what do, you, what do you do to just get people to pay more so that they can create a better planet and do all those things? I mean, a lot of people don't have the money, or they go to buy detergent, yeah. and there are two detergents there, and one costs, you know, 20% more than the other because you want to do wonderful things, which is great, but the consumer says, yeah, but I just want to clean my clothes. I'm going to buy this one. So how did you get that back at the beginning of seventh generation and, and now to get consumers to pay more? Yeah. Because that's what you need, right? Well, there's, there's no one answer to that. I mean, the reality is, fortunately, condoms have incredibly large gross margins so that we can afford to work on a somewhat smaller gross margin because of our additional costs. But uh, I'll give you an example of what we did with our spray cleaners. So spray cleaners at seventh generation might cost 50 cents to a dollar more than their competitors. But they have one important advantage. They don't have volatile organic compounds in them like most competitive spray cleaners have. And VOCs cause asthma and allergy attacks. And when you educate the consumer about the cost of spending 25 or 50 cents more for a spray cleaner, but it might save you from taking half a day off of work to take your child to the doctor, the copay to the doctor, the medicine that you have to buy for that asthma attack, the $1.50, $1.50 that you spend is actually a great investment. And so you have to make that argument, which is not an easy argument to make. But where you can make the argument that there is a tangible, measurable health benefit that the product provides that will actually save you money and optimize your health, you can help mitigate some of the negative issues related to the premium price. Yeah. I mean, that's a, I'm, with... Fortunately, with the condoms, we don't have the price issue, but with the tampons, we do. Um, organic cotton is just extremely expensive. Um, and that, it goes, I mean, educating about why organic cotton from an environmental standpoint, honestly, is just not going to be that compelling to most women that are not going to pay more for that. So the way that we talk about all of our products is focusing on what you're putting inside the most intimate part of your body. When you start explaining to women that, They've, and it's a little bit easier now, right? Because people know about organic food. They know about organic cleaning products and personal care. So when you just apply those same principles to, holy shit, this is something that's sitting inside you for a total of six years of your life. Um, when you add it all up, do you have any idea what's in it? And here's actually what can be in it. And by the way, you have no way to find out the ingredients because the FDA doesn't require them to disclose them. It's it just, it's sort of, if they can afford the extra 50 cents or extra dollar for a 12 pack of tampons, it's sort of a no brainer. Um, but because they are more expensive, we do have plenty of customers who just can't afford it. Um, and so that's something, you know, one conversation we're having right now is because we're growing quickly, because we can sort of take advantage of buying in much larger quantities from our manufacturer and our gross margins will improve, do we just want to operate on the same margin? and just pass the savings along to the customer um, so that we can become more accessible from a pricing standpoint. But it's definitely a challenge. But long term, we have to deal with the structural issue, which is the reason the traditional products are less expensive is because those companies are externalizing their costs onto society. So if you're growing traditional strawberries, and you're spraying the field with pesticides and polluting the groundwater, we as a society pay to clean that up. That isn't reflected in the cost of the product. And what we have to do is we have to move towards this concept of full cost accounting. So products carry the externalized costs. And in some ways, you can't get away with dumping those extra costs onto society. But we're a long way from that. Yes, over here. Yeah, um, Mika. Uh, in organic, in regard to organic foods, there's some of the mixed scientific uh, evidence that an organic milk is much better than much better for you than say standard milk. So, for, just to kind of follow up on your comments, have you conducted any scientific studies on 
uh, in terms of how much more beneficial your products are versus the standard products? Uh, no, we haven't, we haven't done that. We haven't been able to do that. We're working on, I mean, the crazy thing is that there has not been one government long-term study looking at the ingredients found in traditional tampons on women's bodies over long periods of time. There's been zero research on that. Um, so we sort of operate under, until it's proven safe, don't use it, whereas most companies and even the FDA in terms of how they're approving products operate under use it until it causes you cancer or somebody dies. I mean, that's what happened with Johnson & Johnson's baby powder. Um, there was no research, or, or I wasn't abreast of it. But when you look at organic cotton, um, so cotton is actually one of the dirtiest crops. There, it's sprayed with something called glyphosate, which is a pesticide. And there have been many studies looking at how glyphosate has caused cancer in the people working on the cotton fields. So while there is no research, and we're not here saying that if you use a regular tampon, it's going to cause you X, Y, and Z, we're just saying, why use a product that could have glyphosate in it, which is a known carcinogen? Why would you put that inside your body? And the EPA says it's not safe, and the FDA does, says it does. So in the absence of sort of conclusive research, why not just go with something that is proven safe? But in some cases, like with the uh, condoms, Traditional condoms contain a carcinogen called nitrosamine, and baby pacifiers are regulated by the government to have five parts per billion of nitrosamine as the safe level for nitrosamine exposure. We know that condoms have 100 to 200 parts per billion of nitrosamine. So why would you put a product inside your body, which is where the nitrosamine gets released, when you know that the government has already determined that for a pacifier, five parts per billion is the maximum safe exposure level. And, you know, at the end of the day, we don't want to run a business that scares people away from traditional products. What we're saying is, why take the chance? If you can avoid a toxic or carcinogenic chemical, why would you take the chance of the exposure? because no one knows what will happen over your lifetime as these chemicals accumulate in your body. And it's never one exposure or two exposures that make the difference. It's the multiple exposures from multiple places where there has been no study in terms of what is a safe level that we are most concerned about. Well, and I think just to add, I mean, even the way we're probably even going further than things we'd even normally say on our site or in a media interview, but when you, as Jeffrey said, we're not here to scare people. The FDA doesn't require condom or tampon manufacturers to disclose their ingredients. So even taking a step back from what we know there's glyphosate in most cotton, pure cotton tampon products, um, taking a step just back from that, why would you buy something that's going inside one of the most absorbent parts of your body when you can't access the information about what's in them? In the back up. Yes? Um, I have a question regarding what you just said about there being no regulation um, with condoms. Um, I'm actually one of the 40% who feels very comfortable buying them and browsing the aisle and whatever. And I've looked for ingredients on boxes and I've called companies because I don't want to use propylene glycol. And yep. now there's all this stuff with like the warming and the sensitivity. And I also work in the personal care industry, so I know, you know what those ingredients can do. Um, so, um, actually, it's a two-part question. One, is there any, are there any plans to get that regulated, do you know? Because um, I literally have called 800 numbers, and I'm like, okay, what is this lubricant that you're telling me you have? Like, and they don't know. Yeah, so that's, so because they don't require the disclosure of ingredients, there's absolutely no disclosure by companies voluntarily of the ingredients on the packaging. Um, I'm working with an organization called Women's Voices for the Earth to get the FDA to regulate or require the disclosure of ingredients in, on tampons, um, which has been a big issue recently, and there's been a lot of work around that. It's, it's, hap it's happening. It will happen. It's just, unfortunately, all of the people we need to sign the bill to make it go into place have a lot of other bigger health care issues um, to deal with right now. But it's something that we're working on. We haven't... You know, when we, when we launched, um, we did something that actually wasn't 
I wouldn't do it again, where we were a lot more aggressively advocating for nitrosamine-free condoms and talking about nitrosamines and them being a carcinogen, um, which did exactly what we didn't want to do, was starting to scare people away from using condoms, period. So whenever we speak or talk to consumers, my first message is always, it's especially with condoms, better to use a condom 100% of the time. It doesn't matter what it's made of. Um, but, you know, it's going to take time. I think as we educate, as Sustain continues to grow, as we succeed and consumers start demanding transparency from the other manufacturers, that's when you'll really start to think, see things change. Um, unfortunately, getting the government to move forward on some of this stuff just takes a lot longer. And then this, the second part of my question was, um, I know that you do work with Planned Parenthood, but do you do any partnerships with regular gynecologists, like in terms of educating them about your products? Because um, I don't know about other people here, but I have like a very open relationship with my gynecologist, and she's recommended a lot of product products to me over the years, and I think that that might be a helpful way for you guys to go. Yeah, we, we have um, an OBGYN on our board, and she's advocated for that as well. Um, it's honestly right now just been like a, bandwidth issue. Um, we just started our bulk sales program to sell to universities and sell to OBGYN offices and other health centers. Um, but it's something that we're super aware of and we want to get more involved in that space and get more sort of gynecologists and other healthcare providers educated on sort of what's in a lubricant that they're using to put, you know, every day when they're in the office. Thank sure. you. So, so I have a question here. Um, it's pretty impressive to hear this conversation, given that I am from a culture where it's taboo to speak about condoms very openly. So I'm wondering about your sales. Uh, is it mostly focused in the US? And what do you expect for the global approach? Yeah, I mean, interestingly, you know, the US is a pretty sexually repressed society as well. Um, I think in a way, we think that because there's such a sort of media focus on sexuality and sex, um, that it would be a little bit different. But when you actually look at a lot of the research, um, and we've talked to a lot of people who have worked in sexual health globally, they think the US is actually one of the most repressed cultures around sex. Um, and and in terms of condom usage, for example, the U.S. is terrible at it. Single people, only 21% of single sexually active women use condoms regularly. Um, so when you look at the global condom market, it's actually much larger um, in a lot of countries than it is in the U.S. because there's much higher condom usage rates. Currently, because condoms and lubricants and tampons are all medical devices, um, in most countries they have to go through a similar version to the FDA, so we haven't had the bandwidth or the funds to expand beyond the US. Um, but that's something we're looking at for the next few years. Yeah, I, I, one of my, the saddest stories that we tell is that until two years ago in New York City, a woman could be arrested on the suspicion of prostitution for carrying a condom. And, you know, there are many cities around the United States that have similar laws on the books. And if you think you come from a repressed society, I mean, what message does that give to women, and particularly young women, that by carrying a condom, that's symbolic of them being a prostitute? I mean, it's a terrible, horrible thing, but it's indicative of what Mika said, which is this society, while it's obsessed with sex, is very repressed at the same time. There's a question over there. Jeffrey, you mentioned earlier that um, raising money was hard, as hard as it today as it was 30 years ago. I was wondering, as an entrepreneur, what, what's your opinion on these newer impact investing funds that have uh, entered the market 10 years ago or so? Yeah, so it's absolutely wonderful to have these new impact investing funds. But... As the number of entrepreneurs seeking those funds has multiplied exponentially, I find the process of raising money just as difficult as it ever was. And, you know, we're, we're lucky. We come from a relatively affluent background. We have a lot of social connections to people, and that makes it easier. But particularly for people who don't have those social connections, it's really, really tough. 
And we, as a country, need to address this challenge of access to capital, particularly for lower and middle income people that want to be entrepreneurs, because this is where most of jobs come from. They come from small businesses. And when we want to build our economy and to make it more successful, we absolutely have to make sure that not just for people like us, but really for, for a much broader part of society, they have access to capital so they can start businesses. But it isn't easy, and it hasn't gotten much better. One last question. Um, so this actually ties really closely into you know, continuing this question. So based on the last you know, 30 years of your experience and um, you know, the, the evolution of consumers' thoughts, um, the evolution of business. I know you mentioned that you are leading a group of 2,000 business owners or business people. I mean, are you positive or do you have a positive feeling of where business is going, um, you know, th the choices they're making? And, um, you know, when do you think we'll, we'll get to where we need to be or do you think we even will in, in you know, just better business and sustainable business? Yeah. You know, I think we will get there. I think the challenge is how much more bad stuff has to happen before we awaken to the fact that this is something that is absolutely critical and essential for our society. You know, how many more hurricanes do we have to have? How many more places like Puerto Rico have to suffer what they're suffering before we realize that there are real, painful, tremendous costs to be paid by the impacts on climate change for our society. So I, 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 what I worry about is, is how much pain gets inflicted before we wake up enough to change some of the practices that we have. We, we will get there. We have to get there because the path we're on is just not sustainable. And it really, you know, why, why should we come out on a Friday night to have this conversation? Because at the end of the day, it's all of you that are going to make a difference. It's the choices that you make. It's where you work. It's the effect that you have on the companies you're working for. It's the products you buy. It's the companies you support. So, you know, we're trying to do what we can, but, but, but really... You know, it's all of you that have to make sure that you make a difference, that you affect and educate your friends and your associates. And, it, you know, we can't underestimate the importance that each and every one of you make in the path that we take that will determine how painful it has to be before things get turned around. Thank Not you. as opt I don't want to end on an unoptimistic note. <laughs> Mika will say something no, optimistic. No, that was, that, that, was, that was motivational. I okay. thought it was motivational, okay. exactly. Okay. So I want to thank you, Jeff and Mika, for being with us tonight and for all the great work you're doing. Thank you thank so much. Thank you. I thought that was a great motivational ending. Um, we would like to invite you out uh, to the lobby for a reception. And uh, thank you all for being here tonight.